page 608. So we got a, uh, we caught a break this year, so it's not a double Parsha. Normally Tazriya and Mitzor, Tazriya and Mitzor often go together, but because of the leap year, so it's not a, uh, it's not a double Parsha. You know, I don't know if we need the air conditioning. I think it's cool enough if we, if we turn off the, turn off the air, open the windows, open the windows and open the doors, it's cool enough. It's really not that hot out. This week is going to be between 20 and 23. It's not going to be, uh, it's not going to be boiling hot. You know, we'll get there. We'll get there in the summer. So right, right now we don't, we don't really don't need it. Okay, turn it off. And open that door. Shia, where are you? Where's Shia? You get that door over there. or flip that door open. Just make sure you figure out. You get just hold it. Or figure out a way to stay, keep it open somehow. Okay, guys. So like this. Um, Parshas Tazria. Vaydaber Hashem al Moshe Lemar, Daber al Bnei Yisrael Lemar, Isha ki Sazria v'yolda Zohar. When a woman conceives that she has a male son, v'tama shiva es yamim ki mei nidas devosat ishva. She becomes tummy for seven days. Now, first of all, why does this follow the previous parsha? Why is uh, the, uh, the 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 the, uh, the 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 Torah now goes into the uh, laws of, uh, what do you call it? We'll see about, first it's going to talk about circumcision, and then it's going to go into uh, tsaras. Why does this follow the previous Parsha? So if you remember, at the end of the previous Parsha, it's got the signs, the kosher animals, and the kosher birds, and fish, and, and, and creepy, crawly creatures, all that, uh, that sort of thing. So one of the Farshim says over here, well, animals have signs. They have kosher signs, right? There's a kosher sign of an animal. Uh, uh, so there are kosher signs for a Jew. For, for a Jew also there are kosher signs. One of the kosher signs is they circumcise. It's a kosher sign of a Jew. That's a, that's a, that's a sign. And we say, we say in the benching, vel, vel, uh, 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 it, it's an os. Bris Mila is an os. It's a sign. And we say, you're, you're, you're covenant which you have carved into our flesh. So, after we've spoken about the animals, now we're ready to talk about the pinnacle of mankind. What, was the, what were the animals put there for? Animals are put there to serve people. Animals are there for the people. It's, a, it's like setting, they compare it to a wedding. Who's the last one to arrive at the wedding? The chassan and the kala. Everybody's there and waiting, and then, da 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 the grand entrance. She's the last one. She's the last one. I mean, there, by the way, there, there, there's no such thing as an unhappy marriage. Do you know that? There is no such thing as an unhappy marriage. It's the living together which is the problem. Living together afterwards. The marriage itself is always happy. <laughs> you ever been in an unhappy wedding? <laughs> no such thing as an unhappy marriage. Marriages are always happy. But then you've got to live together afterwards. Now that's where the trouble starts. It would be great if you just got married and everybody went home. Their marriages would be great. No, no, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> you, got, you, got, you know, you got to stay, you got to stay together. That, that's the part that's tricky. So the, uh, there was actually one unhappy marriage I could think of. I remember a guy told me he was at a wedding, and the, they had the chuppah and the chassan and kala went into the, to the yichud room. Ashkenazi was farting, don't do that. You don't have yichud room, I started. But Ashkenazi go to the yichud room, and then he, this guy's sitting at the table, and all of a sudden, the bride walks out and she goes up to the up to the microphone. She says, "Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to have troubled everybody had come here tonight. This mar- where wedding is not marriage is not going to work out. My husband just punched me in the yichud drum. Guy told me this. He was at the wedding. And I said, "You should have seen the look on it." I said to Menachem, and he was a real howdy doody guy. Also, I said, "What was your reaction?" He goes, "I was like." I was upset because I, you know, I was hungry, and I knew this meant we're not going to get to eat. <laughs> so normally that doesn't happen, by the way. The uh, the uh, usually usually it doesn't happen. I had another guy, a Talmud here. He got married. They went to the yichud room, and all of a sudden, her the kala's finger started turning blue because the uh, the ring was on too tight. They put the ring on her, the finger was turning blue. So they called the doctor. They they couldn't get the ring off. So they had to leave the wedding. The husband and God had to leave the wedding and go to the emergency room. So in the emergency room, they were able to cut it off. But they, 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 they what do you call it? They had to leave the wedding. So I'm just picturing the doctors in the emergency room 
when this bride walks in in full wedding regalia into the, into the wedding room, and the doctors are probably trying to get stop her. And, hey, Ralphie, we got another one with the ring over here. <laughs> probably not the first, first time it happened. <coughs> so so the, 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 the entire creation of the world, who's the groom? Who's the groom? The husband, the, the, the husband is the groom. What do you need animals for? What's the purpose of animals? Ever wonder about that? What's the purpose of bugs? What do bugs do? What do worms do? Okay, so there's a whole ecosystem, you know, and they serve the ecosystem, and the Gore mentions that. Gore mentions that you see a certain type of, certain type of, uh, uh, of, of, of uh, what's it called, a uh, f flying creature, I forgot which, which one of them, is needed because that becomes the antidote for a wasp sting. And snakes are needed because their venom is an antidote for other, they use it for medicine. So there is a need for them. But I saw an interesting Yerushalmi, Talmud Yerushalmi, says that if animal, if bugs, if, if uh, what, what's the fancy word for the entire bug Insect? world? Insects. There's another word they're called, you know, one of those, one of those fancy long scientific names. Well, right, right. Okay, there you go. So, so, so the entomological creatures. Then we sound sophisticated to me. Yeah. <laughs> entomological, all these entomological creatures, where they've made, I've seen estimations of how many of them there are. You know, it's like, it's like, a, a, it's like a one with, a, you know, how many of them are, how many ants are there in the entire earth? You ever wonder about these things, guys? Their weight is equal to all humans. They, 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 they have a whole, there's a whole, you know, one with 17 zeros after it, you know, something like that. The, the, the amount of them is some ridiculous number. So the, the Gemara, the Yerushalmi says, if these little insignificant creatures who we look at, like, like what's, your, what's your purpose? If HaKadosh Baruch Hu provides for them, then even human beings who, even if we're doing something wrong, maybe we lose that right to have a Kodesh Baruch Hu take care of us because we've sinned. But even so, if he already takes care of the most insignificant creatures, then even people who are significant, we're supposed to learn from them. And there are certain things we learn from them. The animals we learn from ants, we learn not to steal. And from cats, we learn sneas. You didn't know that? No. You, animals... How so? Because animals, uh, ants, once an ant touches a grain, no other ant will take that grain because that ant smell is on the grain. You didn't know that. An ant, well, no ant, the Lord's, let's see, watch ants sometimes, they're fascinating to watch them. Watch it. No ant, once he's touched the grain, the other ants will not touch it. They leave the spell. They, we learn, the Gemara says we learn theft from ants. If you don't touch something, it belongs to somebody else. And we learned sneeze from cats, right? Cats are very discreet in how they how how they uh, uh, how they relieve themselves. They don't they don't relieve themselves in public. They're very discreet. And there are certain things that we learn from animals. You learn you learn you learn things from animals. Now, the other thing that you learn over here is there's another there's a vast there are several differences between human beings and animals. One of them is animals contribute to the world. Humans take from the world. And we don't give anything to the world. We don't do anything for the world. All we do is we take from the world, number one. Number two, we'll see there's another difference coming up. The most pronounced difference between humans and animals is what? We have a brain. We have a brain. And where does that manifest itself? Free will. More than a free will. And where does free will manifest itself more than any other area? Where is our free will where is the sign of our intelligence? Speech. Is speech. Speech. Animals do not talk. Animals don't speak. Animals have communication, signals, whatever it is that they do, that how, how they can be. Only human beings speak to each other and communicate. But animals do not have. Animals do not have the ability of speaking. They have some sort of instinctive form of communication, but they don't speak. Okay, now, the first question here is, so a woman has a male. <coughs> now, what is the word zohar for? It's a Dabra my Isha ki Zohar. The word Zohar, a male, what is what Hebrew word does is is similar to the word Zohar? Remember. Remember, correct. Right. The Zohar, 
that the, 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 the were created, these, she has a zachar, zachar is to remember, remember your purpose in life. Remember your purpose in life. That the entire world was created for us, but remember that we're most meant to make use of the world, not just to take advantage of the world. And, and the, 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 uh, uh, that, that a woman becomes tame for seven days. Now, the, uh, um, the, the Uvayom Shmini on the eighth day, Yimol Bissar Orloso. On the eighth day, he is circumcised. Two points here, first of all. Before we talk about Brismila, I want to ask you a question. What happens if a baby is born, and he's born on Shabbos, then one day does the bris come out on? Shabbos. It's an elective surgery. Do we do elective surgeries on Shabbos? Never. Guy who's going to have, let's say, a cosmetic surgery. Elective cosmetic surgery. Never would do it on Shabbos. Doesn't, it doesn't push off Shabbos. The only surgery that would push off Shabbos is obviously what? Bris Mila. Bris Mila. That's an elective surgery. What other surgery would push off Shabbos? What's that? Life-threatening. Well, the life-threatening surgery pushes off Shabbos. Somebody has a heart attack, has a shoulder, they need surgery. So, so that pushes off Shabbos. Bris Mila is an elective surgery. Bris Mila is not a necessary surgery. It's elective surgery. Yet the halacha is it pushes off Shabbos. So you do Bris Mila on Shabbos. Now, I want to ask you a question. Sorry. If Rosh Hashanah comes out on Shabbos, do we blow shofar? No. By Torah law? No. By Torah law? By Torah law, you do. Probably. Rabbinic law says you don't. Why not? Don't We're worried you're going to carry the chauffeur. If, uh, uh, what do you call it? If Sukkot comes out on Shabbos, do you take the Lul of an Esrog the first day? No. Why not? Carry Might carry it. Okay. So you find that out of a concern for breaking Shabbos, so these things are set aside. So why didn't they make a rabbinic decree not to do bris milah on Shabbos? You said Shem said to blow shofar on Shabbos, and we go against that. Shem said to blow, 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 blow. What do you call blow? Uh, uh, shake a little of an answer. Got Shabbos. We go against that. Why don't, why don't we? What do you call Moshe? Why? Why don't we? Uh, 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 why was there a rabbinic decree to not do bris milah on Shabbos? So, so there is there is an opinion that by by uh, by uh, uh, um, um, chauffeur or lula and stroke and these sort of things. Since since everybody's involved in it, everybody's going to forget to watch supervise other people. But the moro is one person. We'll all be watching over the moro to make sure he doesn't carry on shabbos, doesn't it doesn't break shabbos, that sort of thing. But that, that is questionable. I mean, the chauffeur, there's only one guy who blows chauffeur. You can make the same argument for chauffeur. What do you say? Because it's a covenant? It's a covenant, but, but you're, a covenant is nice, but who says somebody do the covenant after Shabbos? And certainly it's a rabbinic precaution. See, the truth is, man, it's really a trick question. Because chauffeur and lulav are not inherently a desecration of Shabbos. They're just an action. And the rabbis took precaution, don't do this action so you don't desecrate Shabbos. Bris Mila is inherently a desecration of Shabbos. So the Torah already said desecrate Shabbos. So what's the rabbinic decree going to be? Don't desecrate Shabbos because you might desecrate Shabbos? But the thing itself isn't desecrated, you understand? It's that the Torah says specifically on the eighth day you do it regardless of when the eighth day is. And it is inherently an act of, 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 of death because it's elective surgery on Shabbos. But the Torah said this elective surgery you do. So there's no room for it. Where's the rabbinic decree going to be here? Right? It's a good question, right? It's a, good, it's a trick question. It's like asking what happens. Do you fast? What do you do if Tisha B'Av comes out on Rosh Chodesh? Do you fast? Yeah. If Tisha B'Av comes out on Rosh Chodesh, you fast? You sure? Tish you go because I was you fast, huh? Yes. My dear friends, no. Tisha B'av can't come out on Rosh Chodesh. It's the ninth of Av. Ooh. Ooh, <laughs> that's one of those tricks. It's a famous question. <laughs> what do you do if Tisha B'av comes out on Rosh Chodesh? <laughs> oh, yeah, you do, you don't. Yeah, well, yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one, right? 
Yeah. yeah. Here the other one is how many Avinu Malkinos are there? And we say it on the fast days also, you know, the Russia. How many Avinu Malkinos are there? I got asked this question, and you know, guys were guessing one, 50. One. That's the <laughs> an, That's the correct answer. There's only one Avinu Malkino. There's only one Avinu Malkino. We were guessing 51, 56, <laughs> counting the one. There. There's only one Avinu Malkino. So there's an interesting halachic shayla. Listen to this shayla. And this is like this. There was a rub in South America. And somebody had a baby, and the bris came out on Shabbos. So he asked, the, he asked the, this question to the Tzitz Eliezer. Tzitz Eliezer was Rabbi Eliezer Waldenberger, one of the big poskim of our generation. He asked him the following question. They had a child in South America, and the bris was supposed to be on Shabbos. And he wanted to know most of the relatives were not religious. Should they postpone the bris till Sunday? Do you postpone the bris till Sunday? Because the relatives are going to be driving on Shabbos. For sure they're going to be driving on Shabbos. And just like we find that there were other rabbinic decrees, like by the Lulav and the Esrog, and the chauffeur to protect Shabbos, so maybe we should not make the bris on Shabbos because people are going to drive on Shabbos. What would you say? And why? Should you push it off till Sunday? Where you know for a fact most of the people are going to be breaking Shabbos. Do you push it off till Sunday or not? And why? Why not? Uh, whatever everybody else decides to do, that bears on them. You have an obligation to... So what about Lula and Esrog? What about Chauffeur? They made a rabbinic decree not to question, not to carry it. Well, what's the problem? Whoever carries it, will they have ever be on them? But they made a decree across the board, no Lula and Esrog, no Lula and no Chauffeur. What would you say, Shai? Put it off or you don't put it off? What do you say, Dill? You don't... Put I, it I, off or... I say no. You don't put it off. Why? Not sure. Your woman's intuition tells you that you don't put it off, but you don't know why. Yeah, eighth day. Eighth, eighth day. day. Anybody? Put it off. Put it off. Because in case of Ulov and Esra, it uh, considers only obligation of one person, while with Brit Mila, there's Moel and other people involved. In okay. So, so. What do you say? Anybody else? Put it off or you don't put it off? So the answer is we don't put it off. Why not? Two reasons. Sits a laser to two reasons. The first one I got. The first one I guessed correctly. The second one I didn't get. I didn't get. The first three gave two reasons. Reason number one is no one could make rabbinic decrees other once the rabbinic once the Gemara was finished. There's no such thing as a rabbinic decree. You can't go making decrees. You can't make safeguards and fences. An individual rabbi could make rules for his community, but you can't go and make safeguards. We're not there. We don't have rabbinic authority. We can't go make rabbinic law, number one. Number two, the Lulav and Esrog, and this is, this is where I was really impressed with the Tzitzel, his logic over here is impeccable logic. The Lulav and the chauffeur decree were made for people who are conscientious Jews who don't want to desecrate Shabbos. So there was a safeguard that was made don't blow Lulav and Esrog, don't blow, don't blow Lulav and Esrog, don't shake a Lulav, don't blow a chauffeur, because people will make a mistake and possibly carry on Shabbos. Here you're talking about people who are just willing to go break Shabbos. There are no safeguards for people who are intentionally breaking Shabbos. Here's the difference. And that's what he said. But the primary, that's still not the primary reason. The primary reason is we don't have the authority of rabbinic law. Okay, <clears throat> so the Torah says that this baby is born and he's circumcised on the uh, eighth day. Now let's get something clear about bris milah. First of all, what if a baby is not well? You postpone, you postpone the bris. You always postpone a bris. The moel takes a look at the baby to make sure that the baby is healthy. And uh, nowadays it's not uncommon that babies are yellow because of the, the bilirubin uh, count is high. Because the liver isn't developed, is, isn't fully developed yet. They usually put the babies under the lights in the, in the hospital. They, look, uh, they put the baby to, to, to drive it down. And it's got to hit a certain number by the eighth day, otherwise they put, postpone the bris. If the baby has uh, any sort of uh, uh, fever, uh, it's not uncommon for some reason that babies get eye infections. Uh, and, and for whatever reason there is that the baby is not strong enough, the mole could take a look at the baby and he could just say the baby does not look healthy. 
there have been brises that have been called at the line of scrimmage. Right? Tables are set, the guests are there, the mole comes in, takes a look at the baby, says we can't do a bris today. It happens. Baby could wake up on the eighth day with an infection, with a fever. Don't do the bris. Bris is, bris is postponed. Now, let's understand, let's go back and understand what is the bris meal altogether? Why do, why do we do a bris meal? What is the whole idea behind a bris? So, where does this first time, where, who's the first time, obviously, that we find the bris meal is by Avram Avino. What would happen to Avram Avino? A coach Rocco comes over and says, do a bris, do a bris meal on the eighth day. So, the, 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 by way of analogy, by way of analogy, let me ask you a question. Pick a sport. Uh, let's say, uh, let's say the, the NCAA, March Madness. Okay? March Madness. They have the NCAA, March Madness, the, the 64 teams. I'll give you an option. You could pick one team, and I'll take 63 teams. We'll bet. I get all other 63. Would you pick one team, or would you pick the field, if you're going to bet? Take the field. In almost every sport, unless there is one outstanding situation like Michael Jordan or Tiger Woods, generally you're better taking the field. It's so unpredictable. You get to the World Cup. Pick one team in the World Cup or you take the field. Pick one team or take the field. In the World Cup, it's very difficult to predict who's going to win, right? It's too, I would take the field. Hashem says to Avram Avinu, imagine you're Avram Avinu. And Avakosh Rojo shows you, you now have a prophetic vision. And I'm showing you who the Jews are going to have to overcome in order to survive. The Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Crusades, the Chmelnitzi massacres, the, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the Holocaust, the Spanish Inquisition. And I ask you, okay, you could bet on the Jews or bet on the field. And if you're Avram Avinu, who would you bet on? I would take the field. I would take the field. Every, every one of those teams is better than us. They're better than us. They're stronger than us. So what does the Kodesh Baruch do to Avram Avinu? He says, I'm going to give you a sign. You're going to survive. What's the sign? The sign is on the eighth day. Where? On the area of reproduction, which obviously represents future generations. And that sign is on the eighth day. What does the number eight always represent, gentlemen? A miracle. Be of nature. You're be of nature. That means that Kodesh Baruch is telling Avram Avinu you're going to survive, and it's going to be beyond nature. It's not going to be natural law. You're going to survive beyond, beyond natural law. It doesn't work by natural law. By natural law, you know what happens in natural law? That's when you get Holocaust. That's when you get tragedy. That's when the Jewish people say to God, here, you step out of the picture. God's reaction is, are you sure you want me to do that? If I step out of the picture, well, if you're one sheep surrounded by 70 wolves and the shepherd is protecting you, and then the shepherd says, well, you guys, the sheep says, listen, we'll do it on our own. Are you sure? So if the shepherd steps out, what's going to happen? So sheep's going to get ripped apart by some of the wolves. What do you think is going to happen? So people always ask, how could the Holocaust have happened? I read, how come there aren't more Holocaust? By natural law, if you've got an entire world that hates us, and, you know, we don't have to be brilliant geniuses to see that. Look what's happening right now. Every illogical, that's why, that's why I, 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 it, it's not, I'm not really amused. Not amu it's not amusing, but I'm amused. Every illogical argument is being hurled at Israel right now. Every illogical argument. So you got a bunch of barbarians who go and commit acts of savagery, but it's your fault for provoking them. Because you're oppressing them. And there's genocide in the in 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 the uh, in in Gaza. There's genocide in Gaza, and 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 you got to be careful not to kill innocent civilians. Really, I didn't see the I didn't see the United States worried about that when they dropped a, an atomic bomb on Hiroshima. And a couple of days later, eh, they still didn't. It still didn't seem too contrite when they dropped it on Nagasaki. No, no, Israel, you got you to be careful. And then Putin comes out and says, no, 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 human rights violations. So Putin's talking about human rights violations. Need a few more doctors and nurses in Russia to fall out of windows. 
right? They, 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 had, a, they had a rash of that. Remember, they, 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 all of a sudden, the windows in Russia weren't good, particularly in hospitals where nurses and doctors were falling out of third-story windows. Guys, don't learn. Didn't they teach you in medical school not to lean on windows in Russia? All of a sudden, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's so ludicrous, but that, we're not, we don't think it's ludicrous at all. That's exactly what we're expecting. Because the Kodesh said that's how history is going to be. So what a bris milah is, a bris milah is a covenant. What's the covenant? Your survival is going to be beyond natural law. And you look at it, you see, we survive beyond natural law. That's what the bris milah represents, number one. Number two, the Rambam says that a bris milah, the Rambam writes, any limb in the body that has surgery, that limb is weakened. They have in baseball something called Tommy John surgery. Did you ever hear of Tommy John surgery? There's a certain, uh, some tendon in the elbow. Tommy John was a pitcher. And he had this surgery where they reconstructed something in the elbow and he was able to pitch again. So these guys get, they blow their arms out, especially pitchers blow their arms out. So they get the surgery. It's called Tommy John surgery. He's got Tommy, he gets Tommy John surgery. But it's still not as good as new. A, a limb, unless you're the bionic man. You gotta remember the bionic man, the $6 million man. Right? Other than that, it's not as good as new. So the Rambam says, when I go to Baruch the bris mila, it actually weakens that sexual drive. Because once there's been a surgery, the surgery weakens. Now, you can just imagine that the difficulty people have in this area of life, and this after the drive has been weakened. So imagine what, the, what it's like before the drive is weakened. This is after the drive is weakened. And that's why one of the reasons that the Jewish people, through history, bris mila is something that Jews, even their two mitzvahs, that Jews, no matter how far removed from Torah, there are two mitzvahs that many Jews completely removed, but there are two mitzvahs they wouldn't compromise on. Which were they? One of them is bris mila. What's the other one? Marry Jewish. Huh? Marry Jewish. Marry Jewish is certainly one of them that they try for, uh, but they're, they're, they would like that, but their children have compromised it. There are a lot of Jews who have a Pesach Seder. They have a Pesach Seder, and they have a bris mila. Those are two mitzvahs. And there's a common denominator between Pesach Seder and bris mila. Huh? Eight days. Both are covenants. Eight days. eight days. Well, Pesach is seven days. Sukkot has got an eighth day. In America, you do eight days because you're because you got to do two days yantif. <laughs> but but in 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 in, uh, in in Israel, you know, it's officially seven days. So they have, there's the Korban Pesach. You eat the Korban Pesach. Now, there are only two positive commands in the Torah where neglect, like tefillin is a positive command, sits is a positive command, mezuzah is a positive command. There are only two positive commands where if you, ne- if you neglect to put on tefillin, what's the punishment? There is no punishment. You neglected it. You did not have it. You, you, you neglected doing the mitzvah, but there's there no based in punishment. There are two positive commands where the punishment is premature death for neglect of the punishment. You know what they are? Rismila. That means the baby, the mitzvah, is on the father. Let's say a man dies and the child has never been circumcised. So the child never was circumcised. When he hits bar mitzvah, the mitzvah is on him. He's got to get himself circumcised. If he doesn't, he's liable for premature death. That's one of them. The other one is the Korban Pesach. The Jew, the Paschal Lamb, the time of the base of Migdash, had a Korban. If you did not participate in the Korban Pesach and eat the Korban Pesach meat, a kazayas of Korban Pesach meat, by halachic midnight, that person is liable for the death penalty. Isn't that interesting? The Korban Pesach and Bris Mila are the two mitzvahs Jews have been keeping through history, Pesach Seder, and they both are the, the common denominator is that they are the ones that are the only positive commands, which if you neglect them, you're, for, you're, you're, you're liable for the Kari's penalty. That's what the halacha is. Okay. So the bris mila is a covenant, and the bris mila is... Now, there's another idea behind bris mila. Another idea behind bris mila. Do you know that there's a... Um, there's a special mitzvah on Shabbos for a married couple to live as a married couple. A special mitzvah on Shabbos. What else, what don't, I want to tell you, let's go somewhere else with this first. 
What aren't you allowed to do on Shabbos? 39 malachas. Okay, now, it's interesting. Do we call it malacha or we call it avoda? No, don't call it malacha. We call it avoda. We call it malacha. 39 malachas. What's the difference between a malacha and an avoda? The word avoda, the root of the word avoda is eved. What's an eved? A slave. What does a slave do? Slave does, you know, moves heavy stuff around. He does very, very bl- blunt types of, of, of work. What's the root of the word melacha? Melech. King. King. More sophisticated. Much more sophisticated. The melacha that's forbidden on Shabbos is sophisticated activity. What we would call creative activity. And that creative activity is forbidden on Shabbos. What type of creativity is permissible on Shabbos? Marriage life. What's that? Marriage life. Marriage. Married life. To live with your wife. That's creative activity. Because it's an act of reproduction. That means symbolically Shabbos is the day we don't use the external environment for creativity. It's got to be a form of internal creativity. In Shabbos, there is creativity in Shabbos. Coming, we're generating that creativity. When a person has a bris milah with a foreskin, symbolically what's it doing? It's covering his creative, creative energy, his creative ability. Removal of the foreskin is a reminder to the Jew that you are meant to be creative in life. You have to use, the, we are meant to be creative in all areas of life. Spiritual creativity. And that's a reminder. And that's one idea, another idea of the Brits. There's a third, a, four, a fifth idea. Fourth idea, what number I don't know what number we're on. Bris Mila is perfection of the Jew. In the Israeli army, when they give you a, a, a profile rating, if you've had a bris milah, you can only get 97%. The only ones who can get 100 are Christian Druze who do not circumcise. They get 100 on their profile. A Jew, you know, because the Israeli, unfortunately, the Israeli army is not a halachic, is not a halachic army. From a halachic point of view, we regard bris milah as the perfection of the human being. Why? What's, what's the difference? What is the difference between what and what? Yeah, you you have a flaw. You've had a surgery. The What's army that the, the, you've had a surgery. You had your foreskin removed. You were created with. No, but they, they do a personal profile. They do a medical profile in the Israeli army. They do a medical profile. No, I'm saying it's not gonna. You're, I, why they do it, I don't know. I you know I submitted my my uh, my resume to become a general in the army, but they haven't. They didn't accept me. You know, I wanted to be a fi- I wanted to be a fighter pilot. Didn't accept me for that either, so I don't know what the logic is. It was not my logic. That's why I'm pointing out there's a, there's a very little logic here. You're even asking, it doesn't even affect your what do you call what they whatever their standards are, whatever the rules are. I don't know. I don't know. Hey, couldn't you guys see me in an F-16? Yeah. Taking them out. <laughs> and I, I, so the, 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 what do you call it? But I'm just telling you the facts. The fact is you can only get a 90. They take off, they deduct for that, for that surgery, they deduct three points in the army. Now, what, what, what happens at the Bris Mila is, what happens at the Bris we believe the person is born with a flaw. The foreskin is a flaw. And it's only the surgery that perfects the Jew. What happens when there's that surgery? You know, if you've ever been to Bris Mila, the baby cries. It's not as painful as it would be to an adult, but it's, uh, it's uncomfortable. And there's a message to us that perfection comes with pain. The baby, maybe it registers subconsciously. For those who are standing around, and again, it depends on how much you can stomach this sort of thing. Would you watch it? Yeah. You ever watch the Bris yeah. You can watch it. Yeah, I, I'm the farthest guy in the room. Even when I've been a sandik, when I'm, I'm the one holding the baby, my eyes are closed before the diaper even comes off. The guy puts them in my lap, the way he puts them in my eyes, I say, just tell me when it's 100% over. I'm just like, like this. And people think I have intense kavana, all sorts of kabbalistic, all sorts of kabbalistic. It has nothing to do with kavana whatsoever. It has to do with not passing out. And it's like, mm, mm, mm. And a baby, by the way, as he's cutting, you feel the baby pulling his legs. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, 
Yeah, but you know, it's a part of the mitzvah, so I'm willing to do it. But I, I, I can't do the person. I can watch. Poof, nothing. You know, some people are something I'm like that. <laughs> not me. Not me. That's not, that, that, that's not for me. But the the uh, what do you call it? The 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 idea is it's a reminder to us that the perfection only comes through pain, and that sometimes in life that. You know, we have to work on ourselves and work on it. So it doesn't always go smooth. It doesn't always go easily. That's a reminder from the, from the, from the earliest stage. Yeah? What do you mean that's not perfection? What do you mean by that? We're born with a flaw. Okay. We're born with a flaw. Imagine somebody who's born with a wart. So the wart has to be removed. If he's born with a wart, so the wart is a flaw. It has to be removed. A foreskin, according to the Gemara, the person born with a foreskin means that he is flawed. Once the foreskin is removed, then the person is perfected. That's part of the perfection. Is the, is the, is that clear? Not clear? Yeah. What? Now something's bothering you. No, like what do you mean that's not like that person doesn't have like that keeps it on? Like, something like not if he keeps it on, if, he's part of the Jewish people, but he's a part of the Jewish people. But he's 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 in a state of obligation. There's an obligation to have that foreskin removed, halachically removed. If a person has a bris milah on the seventh day, it's not a veil of bris milah. If the moil is not shomer Shabbos, it's not a veil of bris milah. The doctor in the hospital is not valid. How about the one who's in the hospital? It's not valid. What happens is a person who's had a not valid bris milah, so what they have to do is something called hatofas dam bris, where they take and they poke, they poke in a few places and draw a little bit of blood. It's called hatofas dam bris. Sometimes you have the people who, who are a kind, somebody who converts to Judaism who's had a, a circumcision, but part of the conversion process is, is circumcision. Now, if they've had a circumcision, they have to do what's called a tafaz dambris. Tafaz dambris means letting out uh, blood from that area. But that's what the Gemara says. The Gemara says that meusa hamila ha orla. Orla is considered loathsome, it's considered repulsive, and it's got to be removed. A person is born with a flaw. We're not used to that. We're not conditioned to think. We're thinking baby is born perfect. But baby is born with a flaw. And the flaw has to be removed. At that point of removal, then the person has got to become perfected as a Jew. That's, what, that's called the perfection. But the reminder to us is that it's got to be done. There were, this was very common, by the way, when, in, in the, when, when Russians came to America. I remember Russians coming to America, and they had to get, uh, or even to Israel, and they, a lot of them did not get circumcised. So they, when, in the adult stage, it's done with, uh, with at least a local anesthetic. I heard of two Russian guys who did not want any anesthesia at all because they wanted to enter the covenant with full pain. I know a Russian guy that did it himself with the moral's help. He did it with the moral's help. He said, I do like Abraham. Yeah, I do like Abraham. Yeah, well, we don't do like Abraham. So, Baruch Hashem, you know, the moles are professional. Moles are very well trained and they're professional and they use a shield and all sorts of stuff. But I can't, it's not for me. I, I, I get nervous when I see him putting out the equipment. He, they lay out the equipment and the uh, what do you call it? I, that, that, that's uh, that's where that's where we part company. Okay, did that, uh, did, uh, did that answer your question. That's uh, now again what the army does. I can't account for it because they're not asking me. You know they have their rules and they're they're, they're what do you call it? But I'm still trying to get into be an F-16 fight plyo. Yeah. Doesn't it have to do with giving up a piece of pleasure for Hashem? Well, ultimately, ultimately it uh, it reduces the pleasure. Ultimately, reduces that drive. That's what the Rambam says. That's what the Rambam says. I don't know. If they, I don't know that it can be measured in a study. That sort of thing. That's what the Rambam. That's what the Rambam. That it weakens the drive. That's what the Rambam says. And spiritually, it has an effect on the baby. It's a form of kedusha. What okay. happens if someone has a kid who they have a foreskin? It has to be removed. No, I'm saying no, no, no. I'm saying the father is intimate with the wife, and they have a kid. So what, is that bad? It doesn't affect the, it doesn't affect the child's uh, uh, what do you call it, yichus at all. The father still has to have uh, has to have a what do you call it? He has to have a circumcision if he's Jewish. He has to have a circumcision. There's no there's no statute of limitations on it. In other words, let's say a person found out when he was 50 that he's Jewish. He didn't know. Somehow he didn't know that he was Jewish. It happens. You know, there have been big cases like that. At that point, he'd have to have a circumcision. That happened to many Russians. There were a lot of Russians who came over. You know, Russians came over in their 20s. They didn't know the first thing about Yiddishkeit. 
even though that they were Jewish. They didn't find out that they were Jewish. Somehow somebody found out his mother is Jewish, but is that the other? And then they have to have a circumcision. All right, to be continued.